British spies betrayed to the Russians and Chinese. Sunday Times story. To this report, Russia and China have gained access to more than a million classified files. Name unnamed sources. All we know is that this is effectively the official position of the British government. It doesn't make up. It's not journalism. It's just acting as subservient stenographers for the government. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're looking at this week. The UK's Sunday Times, Edward Snowden, and the story behind the scary headline. It was launched during the Cold War, but can the Miami-based radio and TV Marti survive the diplomatic thaw currently underway between the US and Cuba? The authorities in Azerbaijan want visitors to the European Games to see the good side of their country, and they'll lock journalists out if they have to. And how did he do that? Look closely between the vines. On June the 14th, the headline read, British spies betrayed to Russians and Chinese. It was in the Sunday Times, an exclusive story that on the face of it lent some credence to the argument that Edward Snowden, who leaked all those intelligence files from the U.S. National Security Agency, had done some serious damage and put British agents in the field at risk. However, a closer read of the article revealed that the Sunday Times had run a piece that was strong on anonymous government sources. Nobody was willing to put their name to the allegation and painfully weak on evidence. The paper, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, has stood by its report. And the story came out just as governments in both Washington and London are fighting off court rulings, congressional votes, and their own independent studies, all of which are chipping away at the argument that mass surveillance is legitimate and implicitly backing the case that Snowden makes, that governments and their spy masters have gone way too far. Our starting point this week is London. It was a story of betrayal, allegations from anonymous sources that British intelligence agents had to be pulled out of hostile countries for their own safety because they had been exposed by Edward Snowden. The headline in the Sunday Times was bold and unequivocal. The reporter, when interviewed on the story, asked about how he knew what he reported was not. Well, I mean, I thought this interview was laughable. I mean, it's one of the worst interviews I've ever seen any journalist give uh, on TV ever. It's very difficult to say anything with uh, certainty. We don't uh, go into that level of detail in the story. Almost every single question that he was asked in regard to can you substantiate this, can you substantiate that, his answer was... Um, well, I don't know. We don't know. Sorry to just repeat myself, George, but we don't know. Well, maybe he should get an award for bravery by going out there, because all he could say was... We just publish uh, what we believe to be the position of the British government at the What moment. else could he say? He Your could have said, so. we have very good sources, we've checked it out amongst a lot of people, put it into context, uh, why they're writing this story now. But he couldn't, he didn't. That interview was extraordinary because it really just illustrated how hollow um, and terrible the, the story in itself was because there was nothing behind it, there was nothing to back it up. It is the standard practice of the British government never to confirm or deny any allegation that is made about intelligence in respect of our national security. So you say short on detail, what kind of detail would you expect? So please don't uh, come to me with stories of Edward Snowden being a good guy and the, the Sunday Times and the British establishment being bad guys. A spokesperson for the Sunday Times said, we reported what various reliable and well-informed sources from within the government told us. This story was responsible journalism and another example of the Sunday Times setting the news agenda. Whether the paper was setting the agenda or just had one of its own, other news outlets followed and not just those owned by Rupert Murdoch's news corporation, such as Sky News and the Wall Street Journal, which instantly accused Snowden of assisting dictators while harming defenders of democracy. The publicly owned BBC led with the story, despite the protests of one of its own guests. And if I may say so, Gavin, I think it's extraordinary that the BBC this morning is leading on a story where there's simply no evidence that it's actually true at all. Reuters, a major news agency, ran with the Sunday Times story without taking issue with the sourcing or the journalism. The New York Times then published the Reuters story on its site.
The Washington Post eventually published a blog questioning the Sunday Times' methods, but only did so after publishing that same Reuters article. The story rifled through the media food chain, Al Jazeera English included. Edward Snowden's supporters have always maintained he acted in the public interest, but these latest accusations will strengthen the uh, argument among his critics that, in fact, he's always posed a threat to the national interests of countries such as the US and Britain. Usually the media is generally quite terrible at doing a proper job of dissecting these hatchet job kind of stories. The online news sites and the ones that do the kind of aggregated reporting turned it out immediately as if this was verbatim truth, you know, handed down by some god, you know, this could not be questioned possibly. But after a few hours the next day, there was quite a lot of good sort of sceptical reporting on it. There certainly has been rhetoric around Snowden's actions that have been hyperbolic. This quote from the Sunday Times article that said Snowden had blood in his hands was a bit overdone. There's no evidence of that. I think that's a pretty scurrilous charge to make without any real evidence behind it. Whether he's a traitor, whether he's committed treason, those are fair questions to raise. There's a little bit of hyperbolic uh, rhetoric around this. Nonetheless, uh, I, I don't think that's what's dominating the, uh, the narrative, dominating the debate about Snowden. Your suggestion seems to be the story was rubbish. It was then picked up by the Murdoch press. It was then picked up by the BBC. Therefore, everybody's picking up rubbish. I turn it round to you and I say the story was a good story, it was a solid story, and it was entirely convincing and plausible. That's why the rest of the media picked it up. There is the current political context to consider. Not only has the US Congress recently voted away some of the NSA's surveillance powers, but the Cameron government's own official reviewer of anti-terrorism legislation called for British surveillance laws to be reformed with judicial oversight that has been lacking. That report came out June 11th. The Sunday Times story went to print just three days later. And there is an historical pattern regarding notable whistleblowers, the governments they expose, and the news media. In 1973, when Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers on the war in Vietnam, the Nixon White House testified the papers had been given to the Soviet Embassy in Washington. That was proven false, but only after the allegation had been published far and wide. In 2010, when Chelsea Manning leaked the Afghan war logs through WikiLeaks to the media, the Obama White House testified that Manning and WikiLeaks might already have blood on their hands by recklessly putting U.S. soldiers at risk. Eventually, administration officials admitted they had no evidence to back that up, but that admission got far less coverage in the media than the original accusation. And so it is again in 2015, with Edward Snowden and the evidence-free allegations in the Sunday Times article echoing across other news organizations, amounting, Snowden supporters say, to a smear campaign. I thought this was rather strange, actually, a story which was essentially not new. It did not say anything new. The suggestion is that our security services as a whole have been damaged. We all knew that you know, MI5, MI6, GCHQ were concerned about Edward Snowden's leaks two years before. And it takes you know, some kind of uh, defensive action, you know, damage limitation action, because that's their job. Why repeat it now? I don't think Edward Snowden is being smeared. I think people's analysis of what he did is being interpreted as a smear. I'm not trying to smear Edward Snowden. I think what he did was incredibly dangerous, was foolish, put U.S. national security at risk. To be very candid, the smear campaign is not being launched against Snowden. It's being launched against those who want to question Snowden's actions. If you point out uh, that, that his actions are, may not be heroic, uh, and, and you're a journalist who does this, uh, you end up getting attacked. Many journalists and the news organizations they work for have taken sides over Edward Snowden. The American revealed much about surveillance states on both sides of the Atlantic. He has also exposed, as if anyone had to, the media in Great Britain, the newspapers whose coverage says as much about who they are as it does about Edward Snowden and the issues he has raised. On the download this week, our viewers on the Sunday Times and the continuing fallout from the Snowden story. Last week's Sunday Times article on Edward Snowden really exemplifies the ways in which uh, journalists, particularly those working for large and established news organizations with conservative agendas, can absolutely uh, push the narrative that security agencies are trying to create, even when there is very limited evidence in the press. 
helps um, politicians justify ever more repressive measures in terms of surveillance and uh, the, the whole cycle continues pushed and uh, enabled by compliant journalists. Other media stories that are on our radar this week in Turkey, the editor of a newspaper that's had a series of run-ins with President Tayyip Erdogan and the AK Party has been convicted of insulting the president in a tweet. This past Tuesday, Bulent Kenesh, the editor-in-chief of the Today's Zaman newspaper, was sentenced to 21 months in jail, although that sentence has been suspended for five years. The tweet in question that Kenesh posted last year did not even refer to the president by name. Thankfully, it read, the respected mother of this shameful man didn't live to see what kind of son she has and saved herself from that torture. Erdogan took it to be a reference to himself and his mother, who passed away in 2011. Today's Zaman is part of a media group singled out by the AK Party for its alleged links with the U.S.-based Islamic cleric Fethullah Gulen, a one-time Erdogan ally turned political enemy. Late last year, police raided media outlets linked to Gulen and made several arrests. However, the suspension of Bulent Kenesh's sentence coming as it did just weeks after the government lost its parliamentary majority could be an olive branch from the government to Gulenist media outlets. But that's not how Kenesh sees it. He told the Listening Post, this unfair decision is intended to intimidate, demoralize and silence me as a journalist. Of the government, he said, the intention is to turn Turkey into a huge prison for the free press and journalists. If you're a jailed Azerbaijani reporter, you do not expect to get a byline in state-run media. But that's what happened this past week to Khadija Ismailova. Ismailova is in a Baku prison. She's been awaiting trial for seven months now after reporting extensively on corruption within the family of President Ilham Aliyev. The reporter, who did much of her work for Radio Free Europe, wrote a letter outlining her case that was published in the New York Times. It has since been reprinted on news sites in Azerbaijan with some major editing. In the Times' version, Ismailova writes, I'm a journalist in jail for my work exposing corruption at the highest levels of the Azerbaijani government. The version published by some Azerbaijani media outlets says in broken English, I am a journalist doing my best to fulfill the high-level instructions from the U.S. on defamation campaign against Azerbaijan. The New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists calls Azerbaijan one of the ten most censored countries in the world. The European Games are currently underway in Baku, and with the country being showcased, the authorities there are clearly sensitive to criticism in the media. At least three foreign reporters say that they were refused entry into Azerbaijan to cover the games. The Israeli Foreign Ministry has taken aim at foreign journalists and their coverage of the story in Gaza in the form of an animated video. However, the Foreign Press Corps is not amused. We're here in the center of Gaza, and as you can see, the people here are trying to live quiet lives. There are no terrorists here, just ordinary people. The caricature shows a clueless international journalist reporting with cartoon versions of Hamas fighters in the background. It harkens back to last summer's Gaza war, when Israeli officials accused the foreign media of turning a blind eye to Hamas attacks and focusing instead on the bombing of Palestinian targets. Here, maybe now you'll see the reality huh? of life under Hamas rule. <gasps> The attempt at satire was lost on the Foreign Press Association in Tel Aviv, which said in a statement that it was surprised and alarmed that the ministry would spend its time producing a 50-second video that attempts to ridicule journalists reporting on a conflict in which 2,100 Palestinians and 72 Israelis were killed. According to the International Middle East Media Center, based on the West Bank, 17 journalists were also killed covering that war. A few weeks back, we examined the media in Cuba. We talked to the state media there, drew up the anatomy of a propaganda machine, and looked at the role it has played ever since the revolution in 1959 that brought Fidel Castro to power. This week, we want to look at the Cuban media story from the American side, because propaganda is usually a two-way street.
Radio Marti was launched in 1985, TV Marti five years later, bought and paid for by Washington. The broadcaster is based in Miami, targeting audiences in Cuba and providing a counter-narrative to the one produced by the state media in Havana. Today, though, things are changing. And amidst the diplomatic thaw taking place between the U.S. and Cuba, Marti is having its raison d'etre questioned. The broadcaster is trying to justify its existence as a state-funded outlet to prove its relevance journalistically, to prove ultimately that it's not an outdated relic from the days of the Cold War. The Listening Post's Marcella Pizarro now from Miami on the existential challenge facing radio and TV Marti. Tune into a state broadcaster in Cuba and you hear one story. A story about unity, sacrifice and revolution. Las voces que forman parte de la historia y el presente de nuestra revolución socialista. Tune into the version being beamed into Cuba out of Miami. Noticias objetivas y programas de información sin censura. And you will hear another story, a different narrative about privatization, entrepreneurship, and freedom to speak, to buy, to travel. Las cartas de invitación de alguien en el extranjero que costaban hasta 200 dólares en un país con un salario promedio de 20 dólares al mes. Radio Martí. This is Radio TV Martí, a U.S. government-controlled broadcaster based in Miami, transmitting to an audience in Cuba, targeting those sacred cows the Cuban state and its media have tried so hard to preserve, the socialist ideals of free health, education and housing. Watch Martí and those ideals are in a state of crisis. For example, the, the idea of the healthcare system. It was considered one of the pillars of the revolution, the free access to health. But by the several reporters that we have working for us on the island, across the island, we see that reality for everyday folks of access to good medical health is limited. Las pruebas más fehacientes de que la salud pública en Cuba no es exactamente lo que el gobierno castrista ha querido exponer ante los ojos del mundo. I believe that the job of a journalist is to also become a watchdog of the authorities. Only that this watchdog has never been an independent one. Radio Martí was set up in 1983 by the Reagan administration, followed in the early 90s by TV Martí. The government also created an office of Cuba Broadcasting to manage and oversee the Martí network. The OCB says it ensures that Radio TV Martí's news output is, quote, accurate, objective, and comprehensive. Cuba was not a unique target for the US's media forays. In the Cold War era, media was a key propaganda tool in the fight against communism. This station daily pierces the Iron Curtain with the truth. But Cuba has always been in a different category, its proximity to its enemy making it much more of a target. Now, the mission is clearly stated. It is a government broadcaster, and so it, its job, its duty, its responsibility is to broadcast the government policy in Cuba. We're about Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is about the, the right of people to have information, to decide their future, right? It's not to overthrow the Castro regime. It's, it's none of that. It's about the free flow of information. Imagine if Cuba suddenly had enough money to waste and started producing programs that they would try to put into the United States uh, to influence the American public. Would that be allowed? This is propaganda. It's a government trying to undo your government. If you were to ask me, has any of this worked? The only thing that has worked is upsetting the Cuban government. That's it. That's all they've accomplished. For the past 30 years, Martí has broadcast a concentrated version of a narrative that's dominated the U.S. news space on Cuba, a pro-embargo, anti-Castro line. But things are changing, and as U.S.-Cuban relations warm, a new news narrative is emerging, featuring buzzwords like détente, rapprochement, dialogue. The question is whether Martí is going to reflect those shifts or risk becoming a relic of the past. Picking up on that, President Raúl Castro called for the closure of the channel as a condition for normalizing relations with the US. He's not alone. It costs $27 million a year, 
and many in the US Congress see it as a waste of public money. Recently, the White House proposed to make Radio and TV Martí into a separate independent body, in other words, to reduce federal funding. They say the proposal is economic, an attempt to modernize the broadcaster, and unrelated to the US-Cuban political thaw. We simply propose that uh, we strike the funding for TV Marti, a program that doesn't work. This is a totally different place than years back. We are an outlet where the people in Cuba rely to obtain their news and information. Our journalists here have created relationships with the people of Cuba over 20 years, 30 years. This is not the outlet that you know people used to report on, and it's just a totally different place. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. And over the years, it's estimated they've wasted more than half a billion dollars on things that people in Cuba don't listen to, people in Cuba don't see. The experts say, you know, if it reaches people in Cuba, it's about a 1% reach. In a fight for survival, the channel has grown more inventive. Radio TV Martí is trying to break into Cuba by sending thousands of DVDs, external hard drives and USB sticks. A makeshift and semi-legal alternative to the internet. It arrives in Cuba once a week. Nobody knows exactly where it comes from or who has the original version, but it's huge. While Radio Marti had been sort of historically, I'd say, having problems with the audience, I think TV Marti may be getting more and more foothold because of the other new means of uh, delivering the information. I think that we're very important in this process of, of transition and we have to remember that Cuba has been under one rule for more than 50 years, under one party, and this process of normalizing the diplomatic relations will take time. And until there is free access to information, I think that this institution is, is perhaps now more important than ever. Defiant words, but they fail to take into account the winds of change blowing from Washington through Florida and across the Caribbean Sea to La Habana. Radio Martí's days and broadcasts look numbered. Having been born of ideology, it could well die death from diplomacy. More voices on the download now. Our viewers on radio and TV Martí beaming into Cuba from Miami. Radio Martí tuvo una importancia trascendental en la sensación de libertad que quería tener el cubano. Creo que es más importante, sobre todo en los 90, cuando había eh, una situación económica terrible. Ahora bien, con los nuevos tiempos, la tecnología ha ido sustituyendo completamente eh, lo que es la radio en Cuba y sobre todo Radio Martí. Las personas incluso dejaron de prestarle mucha atención debido a falta de credibilidad en algunos casos. Se sabía que se estaba haciendo política, no necesariamente periodismo. The U.S. Uh, funded media and the Cuban state-run media need to acknowledge the variety of uh, points of views that citizens have currently in Cuba. The blogosphere and digital publications have opened spaces for a critical debate questioning the official version, pushing the boundaries of what can be publicly discussed, and even forcing the state-run media to acknowledge problems and to give an answer. The problem is that those spaces are still very fragmented. They are unable to create an open public debate. Finally, Vine is to YouTube what Twitter is to blogs. It's a short-form video-sharing website where you get just six seconds to do your thing. When Vine was founded in 2012, it caught the attention of a film school graduate in Los Angeles named Zach King. King has since created something that's come to be called the Magic Vine, video clips that are just two or three vines long at the most, showing what King describes as some digital sleight of hand. The Magic Vines have become some of the most watched clips on the site. King now has 3.3 million followers, and his videos have been looped nearly one billion times. We've compiled a few to end the program, from the theft of the Eiffel Tower to some high-speed hitchhiking. And we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Grabbing a souvenir from France. Oh, merci beaucoup. Oh, I'm late to dinner. Ah! Oh, this is our stuff, dude. This is how 
Don't you hate the spinny wheel of death? 